to Miss Rebecca. It's good to call on the Lord together. Let's open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Let's go ahead. Once you've found your place, let's stand to honor God's word as we read it. So this is message number two from a message that I preached two weeks ago. And I don't, I don't know how long this is going to last. It, it's not like the other, some of the other series that we've done where we start at the beginning of a book and work our way through or we start at the beginning of a, a particular individual's life in Scripture and then work our way through the entirety of that individual's life. We're just, we're just highlighting some things about kingdom convictions in captivity. That was the statement that we emphasized two weeks ago, and I want to I build on that tonight. So Brother Patrick was asking me a couple of weeks ago, is this, is this going to be a series? Well, here's what I know. I'm preaching on it tonight. And then the Lord willing, I'm preaching on it next Wednesday, and, and then we'll see what happens. The, the inspiration for it, inspiration isn't the correct word, the burden for it has, honestly, I know you may be tired of hearing things like this, but it has arisen out of the pressure that is being applied to Americans' lives across the board in the name of COVID. And then as you, as you start to see government beginning to reach into different aspects of people's lives and beginning to apply different pressure, it should open your eyes to, to understand, well, number one, this can happen. And if it can happen in one area, it's very possible it can happen in other areas. In fact, we're seeing it happen in other areas. I understand not everybody pays attention to the same degree, but the ability to worship, the ability to assemble is being infringed upon in many places. And we even saw examples of that here in our own country, and they're still fighting those battles. And so rather than, rather than wait until we're in the midst of some kind of crisis to where we're having to make difficult decisions, in the midst of increasing pressure, I really have a burden that we think about these things and, and get in our minds the right way to think and be able to draw some lines before pressure is applied. Okay, I'll make this point real quick. Part of the problem in parental training is that you bring your child to church and expect them to sit still in church without ever having taught them how to sit still anywhere else. And so you're prying pressure in a critical moment when there's all kinds of other pressure that you're feeling and they're feeling instead of practicing it at home or when there's less pressure somewhere else. Make sense? You, you shouldn't wait for church to teach your kids how to sit still and obey you. Okay, so we shouldn't wait for a crisis to arise before we figure out how we're supposed to live our lives and how we're supposed to respond. We shouldn't wait for the pressure. And we shouldn't be waiting for the pressure to teach our teens. And I'm afraid that far too many parents have bought into this, this delusion that, well, man, it was good for my grandparents and good for my parents and it's been good for me. This will eventually blow over. No, things are happening that... Be, if you understand human nature, you understand the processes of government, and you see the way things are moving, and you understand anything about Scripture and what is in man, many of these things aren't just going to blow over. Because evil men, once they gain power, they're only going to try to continue to do more and more with it. The world is at war with Jesus Christ, all of those things. All right, so we get to Daniel chapter 1, verse number 8. If you'll remember, they were taken captive... They were assigned, in verse number 5, a daily diet, a portion of the king's meat. Verse number 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. 
Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your face as worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Meaning, there, it wasn't just Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah that were taken captive. There were many that were taken captive. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee in the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine which they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, which would have been three years Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. The title is this, Convincing Convictions convincing convictions. Father, would you help this to be productive? Bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. As you will remember, and many of you are familiar with this passage, Daniel was a part of the Jewish royalty in one way or another. When Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon came and besieged Jerusalem and broke through and took many of them captive, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were among that group. And the goal was to take the finest and the brightest and those with the most potential and then to shift their thinking, to shift their identity, and to shift their loyalty away from their God, away from their culture, away from their country, and to focus it upon the country and the kingdom and the vision and the purpose of Babylon. And they could further or help to further in advance the goals of Nebuchadnezzar, the goals of Babylon. So in his teen years or very early adult years, Daniel was taken into captivity. Now one of the dangers is that we read through the very limited details that are given without thinking at all, and we kind of just look at it as though it's some kind of fun adventure that these guys went on. This was not a fun adventure. This was a very, very difficult challenge that Daniel and his three companions faced, Hannah and I, Michelle, and Azariah. They were literally, their home was invaded by an enemy. Their walls were broken down. They were taken captive. Many were killed. They survived, but understanding all the references to eunuchs, you recognize that there were physical things done to their body to turn their loyalty or their attention away from anything other than serving the king. And then cultural pressure was applied in order to cause them to forsake their identity, to forsake their way of living and way of believing and way of thinking, and to make them loyal to Nebuchadnezzar. So all of this pressure is being applied in captivity. But here's the problem. God's truth had not changed. Okay, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. God's truth does not have geographical boundaries. God's truth does not have comfort level boundaries. What what do you mean by that? We mean if it's true in Jerusalem, it's true in Babylon. And if it's true when things are good, it's also true when things are hard. 
The truth of God does not fluctuate with the ebb and flow of life circumstances that we do or do not have control over. What God says is true is always true. What God says is true for you young people at home is also true for you when you're at school. What God says is true for you when you're at church is also true for you when you're hanging out with your friends. What God says is true is timeless and it does not fluctuate with circumstances and it does not fluctuate with difficulty. And so Daniel has these Two competing pressures. He has this very clearly defined expectation from God regarding the dietary laws. We're not, we're not going to go into them in any great detail, but they did two things. Number one, they identified the children of Israel. Number two, they protected the children of Israel. As this text bears out, there, th- this isn't hard to understand. Don't, don't make dietary laws of the Old Testament in every way weird. Look, we all thank God for the vision that Peter had, primarily that it was an indication the gospel is not just for you, it's for everyone. But number two, it's okay to eat bacon. Hallelujah for that. But we understand this even today. You don't have to call it a dietary law, but you can recognize there's a difference in the health benefit of a Snickers and a carrot stick. No, I'm right there with everybody else. Ask me if I want a Snickers or a carrot stick. I want a Snickers. Ask me which is better. A Snickers if I pray for it a lot. No, it's a carrot stick every single time. We understand that there are benefits to those things, and God gave their dietary laws to identify his people and then for their own protection. And then let's just remember this as well. If God has redeemed you, if God has bought you, this principle is remind, we're reminded of this principle in 1 Corinthians 6. If he's bought you, then he has the right to tell you what to do and what not to do. And Daniel recognized this. We are children of God, and just because we've been taken captive, and just because our king and our fathers forsook the commandments of God, and just because God brought judgment upon us that we deserve, doesn't give me the right to forsake the truth of, over which I have control in my life. He did not have control over being taken captive. He did not have control over being made a eunuch. He did not have control over many of those things, but he did have control over what he ate. And he recognized the law of God there, and he said, I'm not, I, I cannot, he purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat. But to no one's surprise, the government and the culture in which he was residing, they weren't really that sensitive to his convictions. Nobody's, <laughs> you don't read this text with anybody saying, good on you, mate. Way to go, having some biblical convictions and letting God affect the way that you live life. Oh, there was pressure being applied. Notice the pressure. Verse number five is the pressure of just about everyone else doing it. The king appointed them. And then you go down to verse number 10 near the end. Melzar is talking to him and saying, why should the king see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? The implication is there were a lot of people taken captive. You read the accounts of them being taken captive. A lot of people were taken captive. Number two, there are a lot of people from that captivity who knew the same God, who said they believed the same thing, who are just going along with the cultural flow. There was the pressure of everyone else doing it. Then there was the pressure of maintaining a relationship. Look at verse number nine. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. This doesn't mean anything weird. Man, I have have very close friendships and relationships where you can say there is a tenderness, there is a genuine concern for. I have a tenderness towards my church family. There is a genuine interest and a love for. And when someone hurts, I hurt. And when someone is in need, I feel that need. And that's the way we ought to be towards one another. This wasn't anything weird. It was just a relationship that developed between a man who had been put in authority by the king and Daniel. And so he comes to Melzar and he approaches him and Melzar's, he, he's appealing to him and, and he's saying, listen, you know that I care about you and sometimes when we see the pressure of someone else that they're under, we, we want to change what we do just, just because we care about that person. We don't want to make it awkward or difficult for them. Number, number three, he was under the pressure of life and death. Melzar points this out in verse, at the end of verse number 10. Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. No, there were no such thing as representative governments. There wasn't some kind of appeals process 
Where if the king said, ah, you ought to die, then, oh, hey, hang on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my lawyer come up here. And No, if he didn't like the job you were doing, well, you're doing a bad job. There's no purpose for you to live because the only purpose that matters in this world is my purpose. And if you're not doing a good job for my purpose, you need to die. That was the attitude. That was the environment in which they were in. And Melzar recognized he, he recognized, he say, I'm not really convinced of that. Well, read just a little bit further where the three Hebrew children are cast in the burning fiery furnace because the guy doesn't, because these men don't want to worship the way or the object that the king says that they ought to worship. And so you have this possibility that lives are on the line here. And if Melzar's life is on the line, certainly Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael could be in physical danger as well. These are very real pressures. And so you see in verse number 8 that Daniel has purposed in his heart. I can't defile myself. I know that there is a difference between what God has said and what they are telling me to do. I cannot violate what God has commanded me. And yet I am feeling this pressure. It is pushing on me as we've already mentioned. So notice how he responded. Beginning in verse number 12, he says... Prove thy servants. You go through this conversation between him and Melzar, he and Melzar, and this is what you don't see. You don't see him raging. You don't see him threatening. You don't see him, this is a big one, you don't see him criticizing or mocking. Melzar, you're just a clown. You and your godless pagan king, I know y'all have the victory, but the only reason you have the victory is because Jehovah gave us into your hand because of our sin. You're just a clown, and you really have no idea what's going on. He didn't mock, he didn't criticize, he didn't rage, he, he wasn't unnecessarily defiant, but neither did he cave or cower. If you want to put it in a statement, this is what he did in verse number, in verse number 12, prove Thy servants, here's what he did. He allowed his convictions to be put on trial. <laughs> this is amazing. No, he didn't expect Melzar to believe that he was right because he was saying he was right. I'm amazed at how many people just want you to not express your opinion because they have a different opinion. And they're right simply because it's their opinion. No other facts matter. No other reasoning matters. No other opinion or foundation of truth or thought matters. I'm right simply because this. I'm amazed at how believers can become like that. Because I'm not preaching to this, I'm not preaching this to people who don't claim Jesus Christ. This is a message specifically for those who name the name of Jesus Christ and claim to have put their faith in him and identify with him and identify with his church and want to be a part of his purpose here in this valley and in this state and around this world. It is amazing how, how offensive we can get in an opinion just because it's our opinion. And I'm right simply because I think this. And yet Daniel said, okay, listen, you don't, you don't believe me? Put what I believe to the test. Put my conviction on trial. And then he said this, you be the judge. <laughs> no, I don't think it's sinking in. Daniel, saved. Melzar, not saved. At least not that we know of. He is saying to this lost guy, you judge with your eyes and tell me which produces the better result. And then I'll submit to that. So what happened? For 10 days, as we read in the text, they were fed pulse and water. And then they came back before Melzar, and it says in verse number 15, at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh. They, they looked incredibly more healthy than all the children which they'd eat of the king's meat. It was obvious. They were in better physical condition than all the rest. But the benefit of it didn't stop there. In verse number 17, it begins to deal with how they were brought before the king three years later. And they were found to be ten times better 
in all these areas that the king believed to be important to his rule and his kingdom, they were found to be 10 times better than everyone else. And you can say, well, it's just that they were smarter. No, I believe God blessed these four men with incredible intelligence, but I also believe that he blessed their willingness to take a stand and to have convictions, but also that for the, blessed the effort to have those convictions in the right way. And they were found extremely useful, not only to Nebuchadnezzar, but also they continued after world powers had shifted and Cyrus was king of the Medo-Persian Empire in verse number 21. So here's the point of all of this. Apparently, convictions don't have to be a turnoff. <laughs> Apparently, having convictions... They don't have to run people off. Because based on what I'm reading in this text, here was a man, a very small group. You're talking about hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people moving in one direction. And here is this man and his three companions. They're moving in a different direction. But the way they move in that direction, it doesn't see them ostracized. No, I understand they had some battles they had to fight. But it doesn't see them ostracized and forgotten about. It sees them elevated significantly. So apparently convictions don't have to be a turnoff. Apparently convictions don't have to run everyone off. Here's the point. Kingdom convictions improve life even in captivity. This isn't the main point, but I want to remind you of this. God's word works everywhere and at all times. God's truth is effective everywhere and at all times. And for the person who submits their life to the truth of Jesus, to the truth of God, whether it's the popular thing to do or it's the unpopular thing to do, the word of God will not return void. But even in the face of adversity, and there will be adversity, it will still produce good results in the lives of people. It doesn't matter who's in charge. It doesn't matter who's in power. The word of God is going to be effective in the lives of people. But here's the key. If kingdom convictions improve life even in captivity, and if kingdom convictions don't have to run people off, then this is what we can say. Kingdom convictions held in a kingdom way can be very convincing. Kingdom convictions held in a kingdom way. Hey, hang on. Daniel was a part of a kingdom. Now, he was a part of a kingdom that had been destroyed. He was also a part of a kingdom that was new and in power. But Daniel had a higher loyalty than both of them. He was a part of a divine kingdom that existed in his heart, young people. Now, you've, you've heard me talk about this. I love that flag. Okay. Mm, I love that flag. I am not ashamed of it. I am thankful for it. I am thankful for the freedom that it stands for. And as I was praying through that prayer list and praying through the names of the military that are on our prayer list tonight, I am thankful for each one of them that serves. And I understand not everybody serves for the same reason or the same motive, but I benefit from that service. I am thankful for what we have in this nation. Thankful for people who serve. Many in my own family, including my parents, I'm thankful. But that flag doesn't last forever. You believe the word of God, there's one kingdom, and there's one king, and he's not a Democrat or a Republican. He's not any, even an independent. He's God. His name is Jesus Christ, and he's the one that will rule and reign forever. And that kingdom is in our hearts. Daniel recognized that. But here's the problem. Kingdom convictions held in a kingdom way can be very convincing. But here's the problem. We fiercely hold convictions without being able to demonstrate any value in having those convictions. Here's the tragedy in churches, especially like ours. Look, 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 look. You, you know the statement I make sometimes, don't hear what I'm not saying? Okay. Look, churches all over the place are trying to become more and more like the world. 
That is not commanded in Scripture. We are not trying to be like the world. We are trying to represent the kingdom that is in our hearts. But can I also tell you this, that there are churches who would be viewed as more conservative that have either had preferences as convictions or they have had convictions in a way that did not accurately represent the kingdom out of which those convictions should be born. And the result is, you know what they did? They run a bunch of people off. Look, here's what I believe. Biblical Christianity works. Look, look, places, places that, that just appeal to the world and try to amass a crowd, they're, they're typically always going to have, in a lot of ways, more numbers. But man, churches, biblical churches can thrive even today. Okay, I, we need more than that. Biblical churches done the right way can thrive even today. I don't look at this culture and think, man, this just won't work. No, it'll work. The problem is we're doing it the wrong way many times. So let me give you some examples of what I'm turn about, talking about when convictions become a turnoff. Number one, you focus exclusively on the negative. And this is what independent Baptists or conservative Christians, we love to focus on. We don't do that. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't. Now, let's be honest. Biblically, why do we have the don'ts? Because God gave them. But do you realize that God didn't just give don'ts? God also gave do's? Okay, let me, in, in teens, pay attention to this. This is really good. What, let me give you an example of where generationally in churches we have failed our young people and we are very, working very hard to break that cycle and not to continue that trend. And I'm not saying that any, in particular, any specific family has. I'm just saying having grown up in this, having been raised in ministry and around ministry and involved in ministry my entire life, I have seen this firsthand. We focus only on the negative without ever teaching children or ever imparting to them. There is actually a positive reason for why we believe the way that we do. Here's an example. And the kids are in Patch and Pee Wee. Don't get, don't get nervous. Don't have sex outside of marriage. Okay, yeah, we say amen to it, but then this is all that's ever said about it. Don't, 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 don't. You don't need to do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Do you realize that a physical relationship is a gift from God? But the only thing we ever hear we ever heard talked about growing up was that I just shouldn't do that. I just shouldn't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. And no one ever sat any, no one ever sat young men down. No men ever sat young men down. And no ladies ever sat young women down and explained to them, it is not wrong for you to be attracted to the opposite sex. How can you say that? Because it's in the word of God. It's not wrong for you to be attracted to the opposite sex. But there is tremendous baggage and there are emotional and physical dangers that come when you violate God's parameters of marriage. And it's scientifically proven and documented that those who have a relationship over a long period of time, the physical fulfillment is far better than just bouncing around as our culture does. No, that is documented. You know what else is documented? I read this this week, that, the, that the, the, the transmission of STDs has increased for the fifth year in a row. And among many, um, among one of the largest groups that's among is among teenagers. And yet we take, we've taken such a negative approach about issues in saying just wait, 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 bad, bad, bad. No, it's wrong because God said it's wrong, but the same God that said wait is it also the same God that created marriage in Hebrews, in Hebrews said marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled. Look, I'm, I don't want to take this, I don't want you to think something weird about this. I kiss my wife in front of my kids. And they get grossed out. And then I smile and I say, just wait. 
Now, right now, my sons are like me. I was when I was their age. I don't ever want to get married. don't want to talk about girls. I want to live in the woods. Leave me alone. But the same thing that happened to me is the same thing that's going to happen to them, which is one day they're going to, God's going to bring a young lady into their life and they're going to go, I don't understand why. What's happening? It's a good thing. Don't focus exclusively, exclusively on the negative. You know what the problem is? When you approach people with all, a, a whole bunch of rules of why we don't, 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 they begin to think Christianity has nothing positive about it. No, are there things that God will change their opinions about? Yes. And maybe you can help that process by demonstrating to them what is positive about our faith. Daniel, notice this, Daniel did not say, look at how bad they look. Do you see that in the text? He did not say, look at how bad they look. He said, look at how much better we look. Look at the quality of our life. Not in a condescending way, but just pointing the positive. Pointing out the positives of what we have. Number two, you can focus exclusively, exclusively on the negative. Number two, you can have it in the wrong way. You remember Peter, or excuse me, James and John with Jesus. The city rejected them. Hey, 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 you want us to call fire out of heaven? Blow them up because obviously you would be pleased with that and we would love to demonstrate how powerful we are as your apostles. You good with that, Lord? What did he say? You know not what spirit you are of. Even when people disagree with us, God still expects us to have a Christ-like spirit. Well, I, I really don't know what that is. Well, I mean, it's a good thing the Bible tells us the fruit of the spirit his spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The right kind of convictions will improve your life. They shouldn't make you angry. Convictions shouldn't make you angry. <laughs> if this is making my life better, I should be excited about it. If this is helping how I raise my kids and helping how they turn out, I should be excited about it. If some of these things I implement are helping my life and improving the quality of my relationships, I should be excited about it. I shouldn't be mad at people. I should be excited about it. And I should want them to benefit from it as well. Let me tell you what makes me angry. Sin makes me angry. The devil makes me angry. Evil leaders being blindly followed make me angry. Tyrants who take advantage of people and take people's lives, that makes me angry. People being allowed to prey on children, that makes me angry. But my convictions ought not make me angry. They ought to make me excited to take hope to a world that says, hey, there's a way you can live your life and have fulfilling relationships and enjoy the good that God has given us if you'll submit to this. The problem is, man, I just can't believe nobody wants to come to our church. Well, if you're mad all the time, why would they? Well, pastor, you're mad. No, there's a difference between anger and intensity. You can laugh at it, but there is. Oh, we don't need to be mad about what we have. Well, people just don't see it the way I do. Well, don't be mad about it. Be excited about the difference that God has made in your life and go let them see it. You have it in the wrong way. Which, by the way, in order for people to see it, it means you have to have interactions and relationships with people that don't agree with you. I'm not, listen, this can be taken too far, but you can't reach people that you don't ever interact with. I'm going to knock on your door and give you the gospel and then I'm out of there. Listen, I'm all for getting the gospel out however we can get it out, but as this society gets increasingly skeptical and critical, it is increasingly more and more difficult for people to make an immediate decision about the gospel, especially when they don't know you or trust you, and especially when people are as biblically illiterate as they are. What are you going to have to do? You're going to have to actually build a relationship with some people. Be their friend. Hang out with them. And then not criticize everything about their life. Maybe just let them see the good of how God is blessing your life. Jesus kind of said it like this, salt and light. You know what salt and light does? It attracts. I'm not talking about lifestyle and evangelism, but I am talking about your lifestyle ought to confirm the faith that you have in Jesus Christ and validate you giving the gospel. That leads to the next point. 
you have way more proclamations than you do demonstrations of faith. What do you mean by that? I mean, we love to talk about what we believe, but then rarely does it affect our lives in the way that it needs to. The benefit of your faith in parenting can't be seen if you don't have control of your own children. I want to talk about my faith. Well, your children are talking about your faith in the way that they're behaving. <laughs> I want to talk about my convictions about this issue. Well, you and your wife's relationship and how you treat each other is saying a whole lot about your faith. I want, I want people to know what I think about this and this and this and this. Well, you having a bad attitude at work is probably saying a whole lot about your faith before they ever know what you think about a specific issue. We have way more proclamations than we do demonstrations of faith. Last thing, sometimes we confuse, and I already mentioned this, but this, this is such a critical point. Sometimes we confuse preferences with convictions. Please understand this. I've said it. I'll keep saying it when it's appropriate. Standards are not spiritual. You are not spiritual because you have a tighter standard than someone else. No. That doesn't, that doesn't make you spiritual. That leads you to a place where you are convinced that this is the way I'm supposed to live my life. Do you understand within a church family, there, are going, there is going to be a variety of standard about certain issues where some people are here and some people are here and some people are here on this and nobody answers to you for it? Look, no, no, please get this. Don't you dare mock or be critical of someone who has a tighter standard than you do. Somebody has a tighter standard than you, praise the Lord. If you're really curious about it, go ask them and talk to them about it. But if you have a tighter standard than other people, don't you dare be condescending about people who don't have the same opinion. And maybe go talk to them and try to understand why they land where they land on certain issues. Because as churches, we have wrecked ourselves drawing these hard and fast lines about issues. The Bible may give principle and guidance, but it doesn't state clearly about command, as far as commands are concerned. You know what I have a conviction about? A conviction that I will die for? I have a conviction about what I'll die for when it comes to the gospel and the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. I have a conviction about which I'll die for, about what he says about his church and about what it means to love the brethren and about certain doctrines that he has made abundantly clear in the word of God and about standing up for truth and right. I have a conviction about gender. I have a conviction about purity. I have a conviction that a man is born a man and is meant to be a man and a woman is born a woman and meant to be a woman. I have a conviction about those things. I have standards in other areas, and they're not the same thing. And sometimes we run people off because just when they're first finally starting to gain some spiritual momentum, it's true, isn't it, sister? Yep. Just about the time they start gaining some spiritual momentum. Here we come with our rules. Well, you got, if you really love Jesus, you got to do this and this and this and this and this. And you, and you can't ever do that, 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 and that. Hang on a second. Why don't you let God work in their hearts and change them from the inside out? And develop that faith a little bit. Here's what I know. Convictions ought to be convincing. They ought to be convincing. What do you mean? I don't know what they have going on, but it looks like they're really enjoying it. Man, I could use some of that in my marriage. No, I want people to look at my marriage and say, ah, I could use some of that. I want people to look at my children and say, ah, I could use some of that. I want people to hang out with my brothers and sisters at work and say, I could use some of that. The problem is we have kingdom convictions in a very uncomely way. So tonight, the, the, the message is not against having a conviction. The message is about how you have it and how you represent the one from whom it comes. Like, well, you know, it's just the pressure 
the pressure is just increasing. Yep. And let me be the bearer of good news. Probably not going to ease up. <laughs> Pay attention to the news at all. You see the direction culture is going. Probably not going to ease up anytime soon. Hey, can I encourage you? Jesus is going to come back. No, he is coming. This isn't the last chapter. We know that what comes after the difficulty is really, really good. Hallelujah. No, his kingdom will come. But it's already here in our hearts. And we need to be representing it in a way that is consistent with that kingdom. So if our convictions aren't convincing, then we need to ask ourselves, is it sent? Because this is a possibility. Jesus did offend people and they went away. Not because he was offensive, but because they didn't like it. But we need to ask ourselves, are people being offended because of the position itself? Or is there something about my life and my attitude and my behavior that is turning people away? Am I having this conviction, this position in a wrong way? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Young people, here's this is the main burden of my heart, the reason I wanted you in here tonight. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, this, this is the burden of my heart. You can have kingdom convictions, 